Well, that, these are some of the faces of CCDA, and, and I know you have stories too. Most of these are ones I know about, but you've got your own stories, and, and it's so important for us to remind each other of that. And I want to think with you about a couple things now. I want to think about some of the key issues facing us. We know there's always new things on the horizon, and we know that uh, as Mary Nelson and uh, Craig and Kit gave us some understanding of some of these earlier, and... You know, we, we know that AIDS is a huge problem, and we've talked about that. We, we need to keep talking about that. We know racism in America is still alive and well. We know that that uh, prison system and the justice system is still not right. So there's so many things of this nature that are happening. But I want to highlight for you just a couple of, of key issues that I want you to do some thinking about. Not, not, I, I'm not going to give you answers, but I think it's important that we agree that we're going to do some, some, some creative thinking about it. And one of them is this whole understanding of the prosperity gospel's popularity. Time Magazine, September 18th, and that's the whole issue is about this. Does God want you to be rich? And inside the article, it talked about s several different people, and, and the people that they said are preaching this gospel, and they call it gospel uh, prosperity light, are people like Olstein and Jenks, and, and people that everybody's hearing all the time. And we got to be careful when we hear somebody preach something else. We have to filter it through. And so I, I encourage you to think through this because more and more people is becoming popular again. This whole understanding that's not necessarily the name it and claim it crowd. It's just being pushed in a little different way. They talked about Creflo Dollar. I'm telling you about the Time Magazine. I'm telling you that you and I have to be thinking people and not just buy into some of these things that are happening. We also know that, that I was so excited that one of our very own Ron Sider and advisor board member. He was quoted in the Time article and talking a little bit about how crazy that is and how the majority of the world's Christians do not, are not rich. In fact, a huge amount of, of the world Christians live way below the poverty rate and live in abject poverty. The Christians in Ethiopia and Kenya that I saw live far below the poverty rate, even in their own countries. And how we can be so ludicrous that we would think that God wants to bless us with finances and to buy a big car and a new car is so outside of the biblical message but we've got to watch this and we got to be careful because these people are charismatic not in the charismatic movement but with their expressions and so it's an issue that we must address and we must think about I'm glad that Rick Warren in this purpose-driven life finally is beginning to understand that he finally discovered after he wrote the book that there are over 4,000 verses in the Bible that talk about God's heart for the poor and we have to be involved in the poor. So I think the prosperity gospel is one. The second one is gentrification. You know, neighborhoods like Lawndale and many of the neighborhoods, Ted and Shelley Travis, we talked with them, Bob Lupton, and many people now around in various of our communities, we're realizing that in our neighborhoods, it's changing. The face of our CCDA is changing. Gentrification is coming. People are moving in. And there's all kinds of signs of gentrification. If you got a sign like that in your neighborhood, your neighborhood is on the verge of gentrification. We buy ugly houses. Every time I see one of them, I want to rip it down. Number one, my house is not ugly. And I don't want you buying it. We buy ugly houses. Lawndale, this is starting to happen. And we're having to do some creative thinking. As a matter of fact, on the corner of Holman and Roosevelt Road, there's a Starbucks going in to Lawndale. Uh, anybody that pays $16 for a cup of coffee has got to be crazy, all right? But... That's one of those signs of gentrification. A bank, we used to beg to have a bank that would lend us some money. Now a bank is moving in. These are some of the signs that we look at and we think about. Gentrification. Bob Lupton has coined a phrase, and he came and spent a day or two with us in Lawndale as we've th been thinking about this. How do we approach this? What do we do about it? And Bob Lupton says what we got to do is we've got to harness the forces of gentrification and we got to have gentrification with justice. And so we've got to struggle with that. We've got to work on that. The other one is suburbanation of the poor. When gentrification takes place, the poor are pushed out of our neighborhoods. They're pushed out of our communities and we watch this. In Chicago, it's the southern suburbs primarily that the poor are being pushed into. Riverdale, Robbins. Ford Heights. This is where the poor are going. And I know if you are someone now that is wanting to be on the cutting edge of Christian community development and reaching the poor, it's so important for you. 
to think about not moving to the Lawndales of the world, but think about moving to some of these collar suburbs and some of these towns and to move in and relocate there and be there because that's the new way. That's the new kind of Christian community development as the people live, leave our center cities because they're so valuable, they get pushed out. And the poor, this continues to happen. And also immigration. Kit said so, she spoke it so eloquently. When I was in Phoenix visiting with Kit and her husband and had dinner in their home, Ann and I, it was just so amazing at all the wonderful work she's doing. She participated in the marches, as I know many of you participated in these immigrant marches. And it's important for us, as she quoted the Deuteronomy 19 passage, that God says that whoever is in our land, the widow, the orphan, the alien, that we are to love them, that we are to care for them. It is our responsibility. And we cannot shirk that responsibility. These are some more key issues that we need to do some deeper thinking about in Christian community development. But I want to think with you now, just very briefly in closing, and I want to lift to you five things and five suggestions for you to have endurance in what you do. Because what will matter is if you stay at what you're doing for the long haul. If you are in your neighborhood and you've heard, those of you that have been to any of my workshops, I always say, if you're not going to stay 15 years, don't do it. Absolutely don't do it. You'll do more harm than good, and you'll see absolutely no results. If you came to Lawndale at our 10-year mark, and we had spent 10 years there, and they were hard, and some of them were very hard years, those first 10 years. But we were still a little podunk storefront church with about 40 people on Sunday mornings with a lot of vision and a lot of dreams but nothing really happening other than building relationships one at a time very slowly. The first thing I want to suggest to you is obviously be incarnational. You know, maybe when John passes away and goes to glory, we'll change that R to incarnational ministry. I don't know. He means that, but it's re relocation has somehow taken on some of the wrong connotations and the wrong idea because it, what it really is, it's, it's the philosophy of Christian community development that is incarnational. It's like Jesus didn't stay up in heaven, but he came to earth and he lived among us. That's what's important. That's what's significant. That's what relocation is all about. It's being incarnational, living among the people we work with, we minister to. That's so important. Jesus didn't stay in heaven, but he came among us. It's important. For, then it's not us helping them, but it's we working together. But as I told one of my workshops yesterday, this incarnational ministry is not so much about the people in the neighborhood as it is about us. It changes us. We are the ones that are changed, and we're changed for the better. In Real Hope in Chicago, when I wrote that 10 years ago, the first five words of the book are very simple. I love living in Lawndale. And then I wrote a bunch of chapters and told a bunch of stories. And at the end, I, in case you missed the point, it ended with the same five words. I love living in Lawndale. Why? Because God prunes me. Why? Because God is guiding me. Why? Because God is making me into a man of God through the people and the circumstances that I live in. Mission Year is a great organization. And we had six Mission Year uh, people with us last year, and they were all females. One African-American and five other young ladies. One day they're walking down the street. It happened to be a Sunday afternoon. As they're walking down the street, they had what every one of their parents was afraid would happen to them if they came to the big city. A couple guys came up to them, pulled out a big gun, put it in their faces and said, give me your purses. Now we want all your money. And they lost everything. These girls were walking to the L, to the subway in Chicago, and of course, they lost their cell phones, they lost their wallets, they lost everything, and they were scared out of their wits, of course, if you have a gun put in your face. They lived about a block away, which was about two blocks from where Ann and I live, and we have this 40 square block target area that about 80% of our church lives in this little area. About 8,000 people live there. And they went back and they called, they got back to their house and they called my cell phone and told me what happened. And I'm, I'm out. And I'm, I'm, I can't get to them for at least two hours. So I made one phone call to one person in our ministry. And I tell you the truth, I can't even remember who it was. It might have been Victor, Victor Heard, but I don't even know who I called. And I just said, hey, this happened. You know, we, we got we to gotta get by and support them. About two hours later, I show up at their house. I call them on my way and I get there and they said, oh, and I, I call them on the phone and said, I'm coming. I said, oh, coach, you don't need to come now. We, we, we've had plenty of help. It seemed like the whole church came by. 
When I got there, I still went, we sat and talked, and it turns out over a hundred people from our church rushed to their apartment to be there with them, to walk through this with them. And, that, 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 and, and when I walked by, their neighbor said to me, they said, they said, who are all these people coming to these girls' house? I've lived here all my life. I don't even know this many people. See, incarnational ministry. You, you miss the boat for yourself and your family if you rob yourself of that. Incarnational ministry, relocation, living in the community, that is our main distinctive in CCDA. It's where we create the village to have the village atmosphere. Secondly, we've got to be theologically sound. Craig Wong on our board is always focusing us that. I talked about right there, I talked about the prosperity gospel. We've got to be theologically, we've got to think theologically, and we've got to be theologically sound, and we've got to think through these issues that are affecting us. We cannot just go with mainstream Christianity. We have always been a new kind of Christian, and we must continue to be new kinds of Christians. Rob Bell from Mars Hill, who wrote the book Velvet Elvis, and when I read that book, I, I liked so much much of it but one of the things I liked about it was when he said you know we've got to keep reinterpreting scripture we've got to keep studying scripture we've got to look at it and we've got to figure it we've got to do our exegesis we've got to know what did it mean in that day and then apply it to the day and one of the statements he made he says you know what we're, we, we're, our goal should not be to be a New Testament church now there was nothing wrong with the New Testament church it was the best church ever of course but what we ought to do is we don't need New Testament churches in 2006 in a postmodern world. What we need are people who are followers of Jesus Christ who are then living out and being the 2006 kinds of Christians. That's what we need. And it's going to look different today than it looked in the early church. Our goal ought to be people that reflect the face of God. And we are the body of Christ. Thirdly, we must be... People who stay fresh. We must be fresh. Oh, I loved Tony Campolo last night talking about we've got to party. We've got to party. We have the tendency to be overly worked and overly busy. Many of you are so busy. When I talk to you, you tell me you're so busy, you're so busy. My wife Ann has taught me so much. Early on in our ministry, she said to me, she said, you know what, we might be busy, but let's make a little pact together, shall we? Let's just not tell people we're busy, because everybody knows you're busy, you know? And, and, and what she was saying, she said, you know what, even if we are busy, let's not be a martyr about it. Let's don't have to tell somebody, I'm so busy, I don't know. You know, when somebody in our congregation at Lawndale, and I'm a local pastor, that's my passion, you know? I like talking to you, but I love preaching at Lawndale. And when somebody in our congregation comes up and says, oh, coach, I know you're so busy, it's like sticking a dagger in my heart. I never want to be too busy to be with somebody in my congregation, and I'm not too busy to talk to you. We've got, and if we are busy, we need to readjust our schedules a little bit so we have some time, but we've got to quit talking about it. We've got to quit being martyrs, and I'm so busy, I'm working so hard. You know, and, and as Tweet said last night, if we walk around with these, these oh, I'm in inner, inner city ministry and we got, we're hunched over and it's so difficult and it's so hard. You know, Tony didn't say it harsh enough. I want to tell you right now, if that's the way you feel, quit. Get out of there. We don't need people in our communities that are hunched over and saying, oh, look at me, what a great person I am. I'm white, I live in a Latino neighborhood. Oh, am I great, but it is so hard. If it's that hard, you're probably not called to it. And we don't need people who are not called to this ministry. Don't come here and move into an inner city neighborhood or a poor community because you feel guilty, because you feel sorry for those people. That is not Christian community development we've got to laugh we've got to have fun I mean Lawndale they teach me how to, we have so we're having a whole deal coming up it's called Medea's family reunion all right we got Medea coming to Lawndale Community Church and this is in the context of a Sunday morning worship service Medea's coming, and we're going to show part of the video, but we got her coming in person. I mean, you know, it, it took a lot of work, but I'm the president of CCDA. We can make it happen. 
But we're going to party. We're having a big party on a Sunday morning, October 15th. We're closing down the streets out in front of our church. We're putting trampolines. We're putting games. we got music out there. And we're inviting our whole neighborhood to come. Have a hot dog. Have a cold. Talk with us. Pray with us. Let's have a good time together. We want to love our neighborhood. We want to know we have fun as Christians. But we got to stay fresh. We're not martyrs. You ain't getting killed. You ain't getting shot. You ain't dying. Why you walk around like that? You make the people in your neighborhood think, I never want to come to your church anyway. Bob, Bob and Peggy Lupton taught Anna I a good lesson too. Bob and Peggy learned how to have fun. Bob used to have a boat and they'd go out on the boat. Anna and I visited them a few times. and I was guilty, young people here. I'm a driven guy, like many of you are. I was guilty in my early years of putting in way too many hours at work. Get there 6 o'clock or earlier in the morning. Be there often until 8 or 9 o'clock at night. There's a couple things that changed in my life. Ann and I asked her kids one day, if there's anything you'd want to change about us, what would it be? They didn't say, and they didn't really want to change, and they just said, don't be so grouchy in the afternoons. <laughs> My son Andrew said to me, Dad, if there's one thing I could change about you, it'd be that you weren't so busy, because you're never around. He was about seven or eight at the time. My daughter Angela, who was standing up here when she was probably then about nine, she said, Dad, if there's anything I could change about you, it'd be that I don't trust you, because you always tell me you're going to do something, and you don't do it. That began a journey. I confess to you, I, I, I put in too many hours at the beginning, and you know what? I took myself way too seriously, and I thought I was the great white hope, and that I was going to make it happen. But you know what? I probably was digging us in a deeper hole that we had to dig out of later. We've got to learn to have fun. Now, thanks to my children, thanks to Bob and Peggy, I take every Friday off. This is our day, honey, and we're not getting it today. But every Friday, Ann and I take the day, we do something fun together. We just enjoy each other. And we go do all kinds of things. We'll go bike riding on the lake. You know, you can, but we stay fresh together. And I guard that day. The church knows Friday is my day to be with my w wonderful wife. And I'm going to spend that time with her. And it keeps me fresh. And it's so important for us. If you're feeling like a martyr today, I think it's important for you to go deep in your walk with God and say, God, am I in the wrong place? Am I not supposed to be doing this? Then the fourth thing is be well read. You, you gotta, you, and you've got to read more than CCDA books. Read every one of John's books, obviously. But you've got to read more. Three years ago, the church started giving me some time to help me be well read. And so on July and August now, I don't preach in those months at Lawndale. We've got lots of people in our congregation that can preach. We don't get people from the outside. They just come up and, we, and they don't even have to be pastors or anything. We've got people who can bring a message. And so they preached in those months. And it's so wonderful to watch them and to listen to them. But then I only, in July, I come into the office on, on, on only Monday and Tuesday and do the business. And on, in, in August, I only come in on Tuesdays. And the rest of the time, I study, I prepare, and I read. And I read a bunch of books this year. I read three books by Michael Eric Dyson. I read the book about, is Bill Cosby right or wrong? The, the, it's so good it's, 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 it, to understand that. I read the book they just wrote about Katrina, Come Hell or High Water. What, why did Katrina really happen? Why was it that it was the poor that stayed there? Why was it it was the poor that died? Why was it the poor that couldn't get out? We can rescue people in Lebanon with cruise ships, but we can't get a few people out of a city right here in America. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. I'm just trying to tell you what I read. Juan Hernandez, that's a, he, he was here, he did a workshop. I don't know if he's still here, but he did one. He spoke last year. His book on the New American Pioneers and Why Are We So Afraid of Mexican Immigrants? Reflecting Black by Michael Eric Dyson. The, the, the chapter in there on Spike Lee's movie, Do the Right Thing, is worth the price of the book. 
I told the mountain to move by Patricia Raybon. It was a it's a fabulous book about prayer and her journey. She's an African American woman that that's in uh, Colorado. And then I hope you've all read the book Good to Great. And then they have a new one. Jim Collins wrote the book about social sectors and understanding. And you know what he says in there that's so profound? He says we as the church we keep looking to the uh, to business to show us how to do things. And he said really you guys got to quit doing that. He said what you got to start doing is you got to know that the the world is looking at you. You the do you want to be a mediocre ministry? Most businesses are not great. And he says it's in the church that we are leading the way of what leadership is all about. We must be close to the Lord. We must be close to the Lord. Our fifth and last moment is that we must be close to the Lord. You have to, every one of us in here, has to find time. The most important thing is to be alone with God every day. You won't be here for the long haul. You won't endure what God is calling you to do. At Christian Community Development, we are unashamedly Christian. We believe in Jesus Christ and we must deepen our walk with God. I'm not talking about a 10 minute quiet time. I'm not talking about 15 minutes of prayer. I'm talking about where you sit alone with God, where you are being still. Be quiet and know that God is God. We must spend time alone with God. Whether it be early in the morning, late at night, we must spend hours alone with God. Martin Luther says, I've got so much to do today, I can only pray for five minutes and go do it. Now, you know that's, not, that's what we say. Martin Luther said, I've got so much to do today, I've got to pray for two hours before I get started so that I can accomplish what God has me to do. Be still and know that God is God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The great commandment is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Most of the evangelical church and most of other churches have got, they, they got the, the loving God part is, is so important that they forgot number two, loving their neighbor as they love themselves. And Jesus says the two are just, the second is just like the first. So we, in CCDA, we really emphasize the second. We got to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And it's just as important as loving God. But we don't do that at the expense of loving God. We are called to love God first and to love him with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind, with all of our strength. You cannot love a person if you're not spending quality time alone with them. Love God and love people. Dear Jesus, help us to love God and to love people. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.